Hi, I'm Jen Gorecki, the CEO of Coalition Snow. And I'm Jillian Raymond, a Coalition Snow ambassador. What we've learned over the years is that despite how good that epic powder day or trail ride was, there's still a lot more to talk about. So what we're doing is taking those conversations that we start on the chairlift and the trail, and we're delivering them to you in juicy bits every few weeks. FYI, friends, this podcast contains mature content and may not be appropriate for younger ears. You've been warned, and enjoy the show. Juicy Bits is brought to you by Coalition Snow, a women's outdoor company making equipment and apparel designed to deconstruct the status quo. So on today's show, which is notably episode one for Juicy Bits, we're going to talk about Dude Soup. Jillian, you want to give us some context? What, what is Dude Soup? If you've ever been in Dude Soup, you, you know what it is. It's this <laughs> feeling, right? And you, maybe at the end of the show, you'll be like, oh, yep, I know exactly what they're talking about. So, so just stay with me here for a second. Um, there's spots, you know, we're in the outdoor industry, we're in the ski industry, and there's many times, whether industry events, lift lines, where you look around and you find yourself swimming in dude soup. It's the smell, it's the consistency, it's the, the thickness, if you will, that just surrounds. And it begs the question of where are the women? Where are they and what are they doing? And so I think... You know, on the simplest terms, the dude soup is when you're in your element, in the outdoors, you want to look around and you want to see women. And I think men would actually kind of appreciate that as well. So we kind of want to unpack dude soup a little bit further. But Jen, fill in the gaps here. I probably missed something. You know, Jillian and I have had this experience multiple times at different industry events where you walk into a room and it just feels like you're not, you don't fit in. And there's this energy and any woman who's been in the same position, I think, I think there's probably a lot of women right now, like nodding their heads and, and laughing a little bit, but the, the dude soup is this feeling of not being able to escape a male energy that really has permeated most outdoor spaces. I think it's because of that is one reason why you see a lot of women wanting to do their own thing and having women only events and you know, like coalition, having a women only company, because you don't feel included. And I don't think it's just the dude soup not fitting in, like, where's my penis? I think it's the invitation that's sort of invisibly extended to males and not to females, yet by females not feeling included, there's a lot that's missing from the table. And I think that level of diversity, that ability to bring in different skill sets and, and frames of mind would really benefit from it. And I think the males in the industry would benefit from it as well, but because that's how it's always been done, to have the women-only companies, the women-only industries, it feels as if it's like competition or it's in reaction to as opposed to being like, no, we're trying to open the space more. We don't want the guys to get all steamy and soupy when we bring this up. It's like we're kind of opening up the conversation to be able to talk about it in a way that isn't defensive or that isn't guilt-provoking. Do you remember our first snow sports trade show where we go to our friends, the snowboard company, we won't name names, so we went to the party, and I sit down mm-hmm. on the couch having a beer. Some dude decides that he'll take it upon himself to tell me how to design women's skis. And his design, it was the most ridiculous fucking thing I'd ever heard. He said that, what did they, what were they supposed to be, 140 underfoot? Yeah, he was concerned that our super bomber, super amazing powder boards that were designed by women for women were not fat enough. 
And here's the thing in the industry that's so fucking eye-opening to me sometimes is people used to be able to ski ridiculous lines in amazingly deep snow on absurdly skinny skis. That's where he was going with this, was you didn't know what you were doing, nor did the company, because he, as a dude, should tell you what to do based on like a kind of a, it's not even a standard in the industry. I think it's just ways for companies to make a fatter ski than the next. No, it made no sense. It was the most irrational comment ever about... You don't know how to design women's skis because you should be making powder skis for women that are 140 underfoot. So for anybody who doesn't ski, Mm. it's like basically saying you live in San Francisco and you need to be able to parallel park. So most people are going to actually buy a compact car, but you should buy the fucking Hummer. Buy the Hummer. It's irrational, but he was so forceful and he kept going and going and going and going about how we didn't know what we were doing because we weren't making skis that were 140 underfoot. And it got to a point where if you want to actually know the real story of what happened, you're going to have to take me out for a drink. I like bourbon. I like it straight up around the rock. So if you want to know the details of what happened between this gentleman and myself after he would not let up. I really do think that a lot of men just, they don't even get this. And this is sort of like a subconscious, um, not even subconscious. Like they're not, they're not purposefully trying to create, uh, an unwelcoming environment. But when you don't invite people to dance, like, Mm -hmm. like no one's coming to the party, you know, Mm -hmm. like you, you don't feel, you don't feel welcome. You don't feel included. And that's a big issue in the outdoors. People, you know, talk about this frequently in, in tech. Any sort of career profession that has traditionally been male-dominated, women face a shit ton of challenges that go above and beyond just recognizing their skill set. Like, at some level, the dude soup is really the culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's a culture that permeates your sector, whatever it is, and it can feel like you're drowning and you're just treading water to stay afloat and constantly trying to navigate all of these different situations that are put in front of you. And where it gets really challenging are those incredibly interesting, fun moments where you know you need to stand up for yourself, and then you hit that double-edged sword of, like, you're a fucking bitch because you just stood up for yourself. But then if you don't stand up for yourself, then you're weak and you're quiet. And so, like, navigating these male-dominated cultures, it really feels like a lot of times, like, you just can't win. You know, one of the questions that we really would be interested in hearing from all of our listeners about is, like, how have you learned to personally navigate what is a really, really fine line of presenting yourself in a way that is acceptable within these scenarios, but then also standing up for ourselves? And part of it, too, I think, goes back to this idea of, like, do we just go along with the status quo or are we here to dismantle the master's house like what is it like are we trying to create our own environment create our own culture or are we trying to assimilate and I think that those are a lot of the questions that women are facing um, in the outdoor industry and beyond is what does it mean to be a powerful woman or a woman with a voice when you're not the norm so it's almost not the either or but it could look like something we haven't seen before you know we see we see specs of it in entities or industries where women are in positions of leadership but then even just to say that it's a woman leader you know we think of the invisible parts of dude soup where someone might refer to their doctor and automatically use the pronoun he because they would assume that the doctor is the male or the person that's in the position of power is male within the status quo So I would argue, absolutely, we want to dismantle the status quo, because I don't think I want to take the position of men in power, because I think that doesn't do any justice. It's almost like, you know, think of Freire, right? I'm going to take, as the oppressor, or that the person who's oppressed, I want to take over and become the oppressor. Has anybody ever heard of the Cooper Review? If you haven't heard of this, you need to Google it right now. She has a post. It's called Men vs. Women Mm. Feedback Cheat Sheet. So she wrote, use this handy Men vs. Women Feedback Cheat Sheet to translate feedback for men into feedback for women. And so it's really like men versus women. So men are direct. Women are abrasive. Mm. Men are the disruptor. Women are disruptive. Men are passionate, women are emotional. Men take control, women are bossy. Men are assertive, 
women are pushy. And this goes on and on, right? So you have to go to this website and take a look at this cheat sheet. What makes it so funny is that it's actually so true. And, you know, I work in public education. I'll use school examples a lot. We're trying to desexualize the dress code. If I could just go there for a second. Super interesting dynamic happens when you ask people to reflect on the why behind the discomfort they have or the concern they have with student garments. And then you bring up the fact that, you know, we don't really have very many restrictions for males, but we have all these restrictions for females. And, you know, historically, that's what was restricted. Skirt lengths, ability to wear pants, things of that nature. And then for the young girls, it's all about the sexualization and this idea that they're distracting to their males, so we have to cover them up because the male's education is more important. And it's this really, this microcosm of a reinscription of a rape culture. And you say that to other educators in a really non-threatening way, in a way of like, we need to talk about this because it's a thing. Um, and then the initial gut reaction of being like, that's not what I'm doing. And it's like, no, no, you don't recognize the power of your words and the power of what you're saying. And then the fact that you're, yes, we want you to feel safe too and not come off as feeling like you could be sexualizing a young girl because you're dress coding her. But when did a shoulder become sexual or a thigh become sexual? If we can take those things away, we have the opportunity to fix and shift it and let students come to school dressed in a way that has them feel confident regardless of their gender because we're also serving non-gender conforming students and that needs to be part of the conversation as well. So bringing it back there with the culture of it is that it's almost easy to stick with what we've always been done because when you start to do something that's hard, people are like, you want me to think hard, work hard, and it's changing adult behavior and then it is going against the grain of what is kind of constantly reinforced around us through advertising, through social media, through if you watch television, things that you watch on TV. And so then how do you bring those conversations in a really fruitful way and non-threatening way but building awareness and just bringing people's attention to it? The article, Rip Curl ad that just came out, right, where you have these male surfers who are being featured in Rip Curl as actually surfing, and then women are in bikinis on the beach. That's the shit we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's boring. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, from like a marketing perspective, it's, it's quite lazy. You can do better than having to really represent these gender stereotypes and women want more. Things are changing too. You know, this New York Times article that recently came out that discussed the top stock image that was used from Getty Images, the most purchased photo for the search term woman in Getty Images library is of a woman hiking alone. So imagine that. Imagine where in 2007, we go from a woman who's naked under a towel, looks like she's about ready to get a massage, and 10 years later, it's a woman hiking alone. So if anybody wants to question the power of women in the outdoor industry, this is the new narrative, and people around the world in various industries are recognizing that this is what women respond to, this is what resonates with women, and we're starting to see it more in the outdoors too, but I talk a lot about this idea of, is this just like a marketing ploy, or are we seeing real actual change right so this idea of hashtag outdoor babe hashtag force of nature you have women being represented in a much more positive way but then a lot of it just comes down to marketing so you know one way to really disrupt and challenge the status quo and challenge this dude soup is to ensure that women have positions of leadership not just in the outdoors but in any and all professions and that's really I think a big thing that we have to do is not take these images and this marketing, call it change, but really look at like what's happening at a much higher level around decision makers. And that, you know, we've got years to see where that's where that's going to go. And I think that's too like one of the rad things about about the outdoors now, too, is that you're seeing so many women who are coming out and starting their own their own companies. And I think that's really a, a reflection of this idea of like, fuck you, I don't want to fit into this existing narrative about what the outdoors are. We've been silently, not so silently, like screaming, recognize us. We want X, Y, and Z. And for how long have women been considered like, you know, oh, our market's too small. 
we don't represent, we're not like we're a, a niche demographic, which I don't know how nearly 50% makes you niche. I mm-hmm. think that that's like 50, I don't know, 50, 50 is 50, 50. Good math. Right? Yeah. That's called the maths and women know how to do it. <laughs> Because it does matter that you understand um, what 50-50 is in an industry where you're trying to... So the industry is going to try and make money, right? So Dude Soup has historically made money, maybe marketing to males, using women in a way that's kind of objectifying to get attention, have it be titillating, things like that, as opposed to recognizing that women are consumers and enjoyers and recreationalists. And I think it's really interesting that that photo, though beautiful, is of the woman hiking alone. Because I also think there's this interesting pressure and this shift of now that women, and this is almost pitting, I think, women against women, which is why it's important for us to unpack the sisterhood, and we'll get to that in a later episode, of putting women in a spot where, like, climb the mountain, conquer the mountain, achieve, do this on your own so you can be like, I am woman now. As opposed to kind of being like you're enough. Right, but that is such still a male narrative. Yes, it's right? a competitive like, individual male narrative. So I wonder, is the person behind that male? Which kind of goes to what you were speaking to of not just having change in images, but who's making those decisions top-down, managerial, mid-level, you know, kind of behind those scenes. Who's taking the photo? Was that a female photographer? The new image of women is that we are summoning the mountain by ourselves that story's been told. That's a narrative that we know all too well. And I and there's kind of a huge opportunity here to rewrite the story and to actually create a narrative that really works for us. A director at Getty, she was quoted at saying is that it really feels like an image about power, which I wouldn't disagree with her saying that it's an image about power, but I would sort of question this normative perspective that we have around what is power mm-hmm. and what does power look like. And women can oftentimes just have different perspectives on power. And not to put us in the box that, like, we all collaborate and it's this kumbaya shit and we all get along. That's really not a thing at all. But I do think that women do interact with each other and lead in a different way that men do. And maybe in 10 years from now, we're not going to see a single white woman hiking alone, but maybe we see, like, a group of human beings who identify in all sorts of different ways and look differently recreating together. And that would really demonstrate in particular how the outdoor industry has evolved. For all of the men in outdoors who really want um, people of color and women and LGBTQ individuals to participate in the outdoors and share their love, we have to start creating different narratives and we have to start showing different images of what it means to be in the outdoors because still the most purchased photo represents the dominant perspective. It's still status quo, for sure. And I think that begs a responsibility on the part, so as like a white heterosexual woman, what's my role as an ally towards women of color, towards um, women who identify in a different sexual orientation? Because I don't think that the industry is very welcoming in that respect. And I think what that also begs is what's needed of your time. What's your level of survival in a given day to day that you have time to recreate and enjoy and even give a shit about the outdoor industry? Because I think that's a question that has often come up in some of my circles that are not in the mountains that live in other parts of the country. And thankfully, I love my mountain town, but I leave it often enough to recognize its bubble. And when I can land in airports where there are different languages being spoken and there's just different smells and sounds. I mean, talk about maybe an antithesis of a dude's soup, that perspective shift of, yeah, you might be focusing on different things than the upcoming storm or your new gear because you're worried about basic survival. You're worried about justice and you're worried about that sense of rights. So that almost begs the bigger narrative of within the industry, yes, you know, protect our winters, yes, climate change, yes, shift the narrative and make it inclusive, but what's also our responsibility that people have access to a basic human right of recreation and leisure and the opportunity to gain what we gain in the mountains, which is like this beautiful energetic shift and an ability to go on about the work that we do to even have the time to sit here and unpack this and share it. Well, friends, that does it for this edition of Juicy Bits. We hope you've enjoyed it. As always, we want to hear from you. 
Send us a message at Coalition Snow. Tell us what you love, what you hate, and what we need to be talking about, because there's always two lips to every labia.